We're going to be talking about population dispersal now as part of the chapter 10 on population dynamics. Uh, we've been uh, following the textbook uh, Ecology Concepts and Applications by Manuel Moles and Anna Shear that was published by McGraw-Hill in 2019. It's the eighth edition. So we're going to be really concentrating on why do populations move and we're going to be focusing on four different reasons that populations will be moving. This is section 10.1. Dispersal is really, we're looking at, up until now, we've been looking at populations as if they were sort of a, a stable entity that's not moving around. But we know that uh, population densities can go up and down as individuals are born, that they die, the new ones come in, old ones go out. So we're going to concentrate a little bit on this equation uh, where the number that we have is going to be the number that used to be there plus the new ones from birth, the new ones from immigrants, the ones that had died are taken away, and the ones that leave the population, uh, the immigrants, uh, are also taken away from your population number. The equation is really summarizing four different processes. And the way we look at these equations is the number t, uh, n sub t, is the number of individuals in a population at a given time t. And that's going to be dependent on how many there used to be, which is the number at t minus 1, so the time step before the previous time, however you're measuring time steps. And then you're adding in the births in that time period. You're adding in the immigrants, that's i, for the population uh, new ones coming in from another population in that time period. And then we're taking away the deaths and we're taking away the number of individuals left or emigrated, which is E. So E is for emigration. So B is birth, I is immigration. They're both positive. And then death and emigration are D and E, and those are negative. Dispersal can increase or decrease the local population, depending on those four different factors. You can have immigration or emigration occurring. Uh, so immigration is just defined as the uh, movement into the local population, and emigration is the movement out of the local population. These are really important processes to understand because it also uh, includes gene flow so that you can have new genes coming into the population and individuals uh, moving between uh, small subpopulations. Dispersal is not well studied because it's really hard to sort of catch that odd animal uh, going from one population to the next. It's very difficult to study. Uh, so uh, we might be looking at small seeds. We might be looking at larva, but you could even be looking at something larger, but it's over such a large area. How are you actually going to see it moving? I knew someone that looked at the movement of mice between islands in um, Lake Ontario up on the Canadian US border and they had done it in the winter time because they could see the little footprints in the snow. One of the easiest ways to look at dispersal then is if you see a population that is expanding into a new area that's moving um, quite rapidly, uh, that's one of our major sources of information on dispersal. So we're looking at population dynamics, which is the uh, factors, which are all the factors that are influence why population is expanding, why it might be declining, um, how the population is maintained. And it's a really important area of ecology. It has a lot of applications. It helps us understand uh, why species might be disappearing from an area, why, why new species might be coming into an area, uh, might help us uh, prevent extinction of endangered species, might help us to control noxious species, even helps us to understand the movement of parasites and diseases and how diseases spread uh, throughout an area or how they spread globally. We're going to talk about four different uh, reasons that populations are, are moving and, and changing their distribution patterns. They could be invading a new territory. They could be uh, having rapid responses to climate change. They could have uh, very fast responses to a changing food supply, or they could be uh, being displaced from where they were and they're trying to get back. They're trying to return to 
to where they used to live. So we're going to start with the first one, uh, a new territory, and we're going to talk about Africanized honeybees. So the honeybee evolved in Africa and Europe, and, and there was a lot of different locally adapted subspecies. And we love honeybees because they store up all this honey to get them through the winter, and we're able to use the, the honey for a sugar source. However, one of the other advantages of having all these honeybees is they're also pollinating a lot of our crops as well. The ones that we find in the temperate areas are, are a little bit wimpy. If you went down to the tropics, you'll find that there's a lot more insects that are uh, competing for the same nest sites to, to put their hives, and they're a lot more aggressive with, with each other. And if you want to use honeybees down in the tropics, so you're going to need a tougher bee. So uh, they, they had bred the European honeybee with uh, African honeybees, African subspecies, so that they could be a little bit tougher and uh, able to defend themselves and get the ne nest sites. So these are called Africanized honeybees. Sometimes you hear them referred to as killer bees. Uh, it turns out that they disperse and move across the landscape much faster than European honeybees. So, so uh, they wanted to, when they developed these subspecies of Africanized honeybees as hybrid, they wanted to make sure that they were uh, doing some experiments on them in Brazil and that they would be in uh, tight control. What happened one day that somebody was working on one of the hives and they had little guards on the opening of the hive that were too small for the queen to go out and they forgot to put the guards back on and so queens escaped uh, from these uh, experimental hives in Brazil. Within 30 years, they'd occupied most of South America, Mexico, and all of Central America. So, so these guys spread extremely fast. So this is an example of a very quick dispersal rate. Very unusual. So here we can see the um, European honeybee. Here's a, a queen with all her drones of the African honeybee. And then they were hybridized to make this Africanized honeybee. The map from their textbook and it's showing you uh, the spread of the uh, Africanized honeybees from uh, South America uh, and the years that they, they reached different places. So they escaped in Brazil in 1957. By 1982, they got to the to Panama. They were uh, moving through Mexico um, until the 1990s. They got into the U.S. Uh, 2010, they even had managed to zoom over to Florida. So these guys, the one thing that is cold, uh, preventing them from getting further north is uh, one of the uh, factors we've talked about when we talk about limits on distributions and that's cold temperatures which has uh, halted the northern spread of the Africanized honeybee. However, with climate change and global warming that northern boundary will be expanded again. Another example of a species that is able to expand its range and go into new territory was the Eurasian collared dove. And the Eurasian colored dove uh, did this on its own. Uh, we didn't actually uh, move it to somewhere new. We didn't create a new species. This is something that it did on its own. This bird looks a lot like the morning doves you've probably seen in your backyard or around the area. It coos like a, a quite similar to a morning dove, but it's got the little black collar, so it's a, it's a collared dove. Um, this dispersal began suddenly. It was not anything uh, that humans did to make it spread around. Uh, and uh, it took place in relatively small leaps. So what, what happens with that is that uh, the adults are very sedentary. So they like they get their nesting site, they get their place to live, they don't want to leave it. The young doves then are doing most of the dispersing. And they usually stay within a, a few kilometers of their parents' nest. But then there's the odd ones that just go hundreds of kilometers away. And once they've chosen a mate, the, um, they will nest and become sedentary. So they sort of make a new colony in that location. And so you get these, these jumps of the, the doves to long distances and making little colonies, which means that their dispersal rate um, has is much higher than most species. It's about 45 
kilometers a year, not as fast as the uh, Africanized honeybee, which was spreading at a dispersal rate of 300 to 500 kilometers a year. When we look at the expansion of the collared doves across Europe, we can see they started down in the right hand corner in 1900. They were just in, in Turkey. And then we can see them spreading out uh, different decades. Uh, they managed to get by 19, uh, 1940, they jumped the English Channel, got into England. Uh, by 1970, they'd spread out over to Ireland and uh, had spread quite uh, across all of, of Europe. At that point. So, this was a fairly rapid spread at uh, about 45 kilometers a year. This is looking at the distances that the colored doves were dispersing at the fledgling. So, so, once they had learned how to fly and take off, they spread out from where their parents live. Most of them, so the x axis is showing you the the distance that they moved to, uh, how far they dispersed, and the y-axis showing you uh, the poor proportion of the nestlings, the fledglings that were doing the dispersing. And you can see that uh, most of them did not go a long distance, but we could see some of them were uh, going uh, 400 kilometers and 500 kilometers and 600 kilometers away. So even though the average is around 45 uh, kilometers a year. Some of them are, are going quite long distances before they find, found a place that they wanted to settle down. Some additional information that was not included in your textbook was that they were also introduced accidentally into the Bahamas. So someone had taken some as pets and had they'd escaped in 1974. They spread to Florida, uh, onto the mainland of the U.S. and expanded westward and northward from there since the 1980s. And uh, there's a little simulation video of that that you can take a look up on YouTube. I've put it in the, the playlist on our YouTube playlist where you can watch, pause it now and watch that uh, YouTube video. The uh, the species, the collared dove is now, the Eurasian collared dove is now common across North America, as far as Northwest as Oregon and Washington. They um, are found occasionally, you see the odd one in the Northeastern states, but uh, those are just a few strays here and there. They're not well established. If you go to a a site called ebird.org. You can actually get a free account and sign up to that. And this gives you a whole bunch of information on bird distributions all across uh, North America. And uh, a little YouTube video, I'm giving you a link here at the bottom that you could click on about what eBird is, which is a really useful and cool site. But I got this map off of it. This is the distribution map of sightings of the East Eurasian collared dove. And so on eBird, when you actually see and identify a bird, you can submit that sighting and then it gets added into this big database. Um, a lot of just avid birders out there put in that information. So we can see the darker purple are, are multiple sightings, the darker the, the color the more sightings there are. And then if we uh, look up into the New Jersey area, there's just a few little purple spots and there's just been the occasional sightings. Most of the sightings in New Jersey are down in the Cape May area. I think there's been one individual sighted in Gloucester County. Up to this point, we've talked about a couple of different species. We've talked about the Africanized honeybee, which is uh, shown as the first bar on this graph. And we can see its dispersal distances in kilometer a year. Uh, we know they range from uh, 300 to 500 
kilometers a year on average we ended up at about 400 kilometers a year so it really stands out as being quite different from the other species the eurasian collared dove is also shown on here um, but a much lower dispersal rate on average around 45 kilometers a year and uh, so we can see that uh, obviously the african highest honeybees are an anomaly but uh, we've got several examples of a species dispersal rates and, and how far how quickly they can get a certain distances. Another reason species are going to uh, change their distributions is in response to climate change and uh, this can be a quite a rapid result response we, we have been seeing very rapid changes in the climate which is going to change the distribution limits of the species uh, there were previously there were huge climate changes in north america and uh, this is a map of looking at north america during the pleistocene and you can see during the pleistocene uh, a lot of north america most of north america was covered in these huge glacial ice sheets and uh, when these ice sheets melted in New Jersey, uh, they started to melt in our area around uh, 10, 10 and a half thousand years ago down in this region. <coughs> there was a lot of water tied up in these ice sheets and, and uh, we can see that the limit of land, so the shoreline was much further out at that time than it is now. And then as those glaciers melted, that water rushed into the oceans and the oceans uh, rose. And now we have our current shorelines are, are much closer in. And uh, as these glaciers melted, then all this area where they had been is now available for species to move into. And uh, they started to expand their distributions back north uh, maybe to places that they used to live maybe expand into new territory as things warmed up so the organisms spread northward following the re retreat of the glaciers and the warming the climate and uh, so the glaciers started melting around 16,000 years ago in New Jersey uh, we talk about the the uh, end of the place to see seeing that melting and the habitat becoming available about ten and a half thousand years ago. One of the researchers they talk about, uh, they talked about in your very first chapter of the textbook was uh, Margaret Davis, who was looking at pollen that was preserved in lake sediments, because when you look at the pollen, you can identify what species were there and how that changed as the species were moving with the, the changing climate. And the dispersal rate of the trees that were giving off this pollen, so these are wind pollinated trees, is around 100 to 400 meters per year. So remember the Africanized honeybees, we were talking about 300 to 500 kilometers a year. Now we're talking about 100 to 400 meters per year. So much slower dispersal rates. The collared doves were 45 kilometers a year. Now we're looking at, at the most maybe um, half a kilometer in a year. So the tree distribution is uh, similar, dispersal rate is similar to that that we would find in large mammals. And uh, one one hundredth of the rate of the collared doves and a thousandth of the rate of the Africanized honeybees. These are some of Margaret Davis's maps of two different species. On the left, we have maple, and on the right, we have hemlock. And we can see that the maples, when the glaciers were extant, the maples were really uh, confined down in the, the southern U.S. And then they started spreading as things started to warm up about 16,000 years ago. They started to spread back up. And so when the glaciers uh, were leaving our area, then they could move up into that region and now they have reached their, their present range, which they got to uh, just around 6,000 years ago. Uh, uh, so that was going um, a quite a wide distance, a long distance over 6,000 years. The graph on the right hand side is showing hemlock. Hemlock was down in the southeast during the time of the uh, maximum glaciation and then they spread, but they spread much slower. 
So when we look at the, the seed of a hemlock tree, it's got a seed with a little wing on it. But then when you look at the seed of a maple tree, you know those maple keys have really big wings on them. And they, they're the little helicopters that spin around. And so we can see that the maple ones probably just fly further uh, and able to spread much faster than the hemlocks. Another reason a species could very rapidly uh, move its population and move from one place to another is because of some sort of change in the food supply. And Holling had observed that there had been differences in population sizes uh, that were happening when there was more prey available. That more prey density led to increased density of predators. That the individuals could move into the new areas uh, in response to high prey densities. So if there's a lot of squirrels in, in the park, then you're going to get more hawks moving into the area. So a study looking at uh, some predators, the European kestrel, short-eared owls, long-eared owls um, in Europe, was looking at did the number of owls and, and uh, kestrels uh, in an area increase if we had increased numbers of voles. And voles are very small, small mammals. They're very good prey for all of these guys. Here's some pictures of the predators with the kestrels and the long-eared and short-eared owls. In the center is a cute little vole. And you can see at the bottom center, there's a kestrel that is holding the vole that is, is trapped. This was a 10-year study. And they did know during the, the time that there were uh, different years where they had huge numbers of voles in the area. So it was a, a, a high number in 1977. There was a number in 1982. There was also high numbers in 1985 in 1986, um, but there were also times where there were very few voles uh, in 1980 and 1984. During the times when there were um, more voles, they found more predatory birds, and times when there were fewer voles, they found fewer predatory birds. So the next uh, slide will show you that data. So when we look at the uh, voles, they're the little blue dots on the graph. So we've got the different, the 10-year the uh, time period across the x-axis. We have the number of uh, voles per square kilometer on the y-axis. And then we have a second axis up here where we have the number of pairs of kestrels and owls. And we can see that uh, the vole densities, the, the blue vole densities were uh, peaking in the very beginning of the study and at various times throughout the study. When they peaked in the vole densities, we also saw the kestrels and owls uh, immediately would increase their numbers when there were lots of voles, but then they would decrease their numbers when there were very few voles. So there was no lag. They were doing it instantly. Uh, so that uh, if there was a time lag, it would uh, probably be that they would come one year, they would eat a lot of owls, then there'd be lots of baby owls, and the next year you'd have a large number of owls, even if the voles had dropped off. There would be a delayed response. But because this is immediate, it's probably uh, simply that the, uh, the owls and the kestrels are just flying in to the study area. They're basically nomads, and they're moving from place to place, uh, responding to how many prey are available to them. They found very low recapture rates, so they did mark recapture studies so that they would know if they'd seen these birds before. And they found that really they were just seeing new birds flying in in different years, uh, so it wasn't the same uh, individuals.
So here in, in the uh, diagram, we've got the colonization uh, cycle showing you that uh, drift will move the organisms downstream and sometimes uh, it'll happen uh, actively, something like a salmon going downstream, or sometimes it's going to be uh, a passive that, that you're being forced downstream by a flood. And then a lot of organisms will have some sort of uh, upstream movement that's going to uh, keep them in place constantly because of the drift, or they'll have mechanisms to get back upstream if there's been some sort of uh, large displacement. So we've talked about four reasons for populations uh, expanding or moving. Uh, could be they're invading a new territory. Could be a rapid response to climate change. We've seen species that are moving around their populations as their food supply is changing and the displacement of populations in a stream. So this is the end of concept review section, uh, con uh, concept section 10.1. And you should be able to answer the question, why might a species such as the Eurasian collared dove be less threatened by rapid climate change than hemlock or maple trees. So pay attention to the dispersal rates of those species. Um, overall, we're going to be going next to the uh, next sections of this chapter, but also take a look at Appendix 1, or Appendix 10, investigating the evidence on hypotheses and statistical significance and be able to answer the question there. And we will see you in Section 10.2, where we're going to start talking about metapopulations.